Hello everyone, and welcome to part 11 of this Hackolate tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about how you can use Hackolate and Hackolate Studio for creating a model for graph databases. This is interesting, not just because I have a long history with graph databases, but also because this is very specific to a particular type of NoSQL databases, like for example Neo4j, my former employer, but also Cosmos DB has a Gremlin API, Janus Graph, Neptune has a Gremlin API, and other Tinkerpop-based uh, NoSQL databases that are going to allow you to create these labeled property graph data stores. So what are we talking about here? Well, first of all, we're talking about a special family of NoSQL databases, right? Uh, whereas most uh, NoSQL databases are actually uh, what we call aggregate stores, right? So they create some kind of um, aggregate of um, your data in, the, in, uh, in line with your access patterns, right? So a document format or a white column uh, uh, format or a key value uh, store, right? Something like that. Um, Property graphs and labeled property graphs actually do something completely different, right? What they will do is they will create these network structures where the relationships between the uh, instances of entities, right, are actually an explicit part of your data model. They refer to this as treating the relationships as first-class citizens, right? So it allows you to basically see immediately without doing any kind of calculation, without doing any kind of joining of data, uh, how things are connected to each other. This is useful because uh, it can reveal sometimes these hidden relationships between different entities, hidden, hidden in the sense of indirect relationships between entities that um, are important to particular types of use cases. Right? So this is different from other uh, databases. Right? In relational databases, you already have some kind of a concept of a um, relationship by having things like um, join tables, right? but you would still need to calculate the join um, at read time. Right? So you would enter uh, key information into the join table, but you would still need to actually join things together at read time. Um, uh, other data, data stores, like these aggregate data stores, would basically leave that up to the application, right? So you would either embed the relationships into a, an aggregate document structure of some sorts that um, has uh, information about the relationships inside the document, or you would leave it up to the application uh, to do the joining at read time. So graph databases explicitly connect the data at write time. So not you know at read time, but at write time. So Typically, you know, a higher write um, cost, right? So it, it takes more time to write something into a graph database, but very, very fast read times because joins become very, very simple. This has a lot of use cases in things like fraud detection, recommendation engines, social networks, pathfinding in logistics, you know, all of these types of things are, are actually really interesting use cases, which is probably why I spent so much time working with them uh, at Neo4j. Having said that, um, this is not about me, uh, about property data, graph databases. Um, what we're going to be looking at here is how you use nodes, or sometimes also referred to as vertices, as um, uh, places where you can store your entities, right? So a person, a car, a uh, vehicle, a uh, city, you know, whatever it is, you know, would be a uh, vertex, right? Um, and the relationships between those vertices uh, are sometimes also referred to as edges, right? And they represent the individual links between specific instances of these entities. Right? Uh, properties on both nodes and relationships allow you to qualify these. So you, so you can say something about the node, about the person, by giving it a uh, name property, a name attribute. Same thing with relationships, and this is actually quite uh, significant and differentiating. You can qualify a relationship. You can say something about a relationship by assigning a property to it. So um, Rick is mar married to Kathleen. Okay, the married to relationship, you can qualify that by saying, you know, the date of the marriage, for example, or since date, something like that. Right? So you can say something about both the nodes and the relationships by assigning properties to qualify them. 
You also have these special types of properties. Um, for uh, nodes, we call these labels, right? Uh, labels are specific types of properties that group nodes together in subgraphs, right? So these are all my persons, these are all my cities, these are all my uh, cars, whatever it might be, right? So you're, you're assigning a special type of property called a label to do that. So these things are special because labels will oftentimes be used for things like uh, assigning security privileges or um, assigning indexing capabilities or those types of things. And the same thing applies to um, a relationship. A relationship has a type, right, uh, which is a special type of property which categorizes the relationship. They're a little bit different depending on the implementation. Um, I would like to add that these property graphs are, and graphs in general are visually quite attractive and this is some thing why uh, many people are attracted to graph databases because it's so easy and so, so uh, intuitive to reason about. But of course we can also, and this is what we'll do in uh, Hackerlaid, we can actually also represent this as a um, entity relationship diagram, right? Very simply put, you know, the nodes can, be can become the blue boxes and the relationships can become the uh, black boxes that you see on this ERD. So very easy. Um, I will show you in the in the demo a little bit later on how you can create these graph um, models, right? Uh, by basically diagramming it in Hackerlaid, right? Very very simple to use. Um, and then of course um, we have a couple of specific toolbar functions that will allow you to lay out these diagrams, to uh, display them in a certain way. You know the label names, the attribute boxes, um, and lots of different controls that are available for doing this type of modeling. And of course, you know, there's uh, very interesting capabilities, like with all of the Hackerlate models, to integrate this into a bigger modeling effort by using things like polyglot data models or by using things like uh, external references or re reusable attributes. You know, all of this is, uh, is available as well for property graphs. Um, Having said that, you know, there are quite a few differences between the capabilities of the different property graph implementations, right? So some of them actually have some kind of a schema associated to them. Some of them have no schema. And, and as a consequence, you know, the forward engineering capabilities of Hackerlaid are going to be quite different dependent on your choice of property graph implementation. Right, so you will have to um, investigate that and, and read up on that so that you know exactly what to expect for every single one of your um, uh, plugins and target architectures that you're going to be choosing. Right, so lots of documentation available. Um, please note that there's uh, actually a really great Neo4j data modeling book that was published by the same publisher that published the MongoDB data modeling and schema design book that um, uh, Pascal Desmarais of Hackerlaid co-authored. Uh, you will find that in the Neo4j book authored by Dave Foth and Steve Hoberman, um, there's also ex you know, elaborate use of Hackerlaid um, uh, illustrations. So I would highly recommend that you take a look at that. Now, with that, I'm going to quickly switch to a short demo, and uh, hopefully that will uh, wrap up this uh, tutorial. So here we are in our Hackerlate studio, and I'm going to create a new model. I'm going to select Neo4j for this, um, last version of uh, Neo4j, and then I can basically start over here and say, okay, let me add a new database, right, the tutorial database, and then inside that database, I'm going to add a node. Um, in that node, I'm going to say this is the person, right? And then I'm going to add another node label, right? And I'm going to call this the city, right? Uh, I can add attributes to these um, uh, nodes, you know, by, for example, clicking over here and saying, okay, I want you to have a property key. That property key is going to be a string. That's going to be in an ID first. And then I'm going to add one more, which is the name of that person. And then I'm going to add an, uh, uh, an uh, ID to the city as well and say, you know, this is also, a, it has a name, right? And then I can say, okay, these two things are related to each other. So let's add a relationship to that. And this relationship is going to be the lives in relationship, right? And then I can say, okay, this lives in relationship actually has a property, right? So, um, and I will um, add the property to that relationship right here. Um, so I'm going to say, okay, this one has, oh, sorry, I'm going to add a property key here, and that is going to be a um, temporal data type, right? And that temporal data type is of a subtype date, uh, so that we know since when, 
uh, uh, rig has been living or someone has been living in that particular city, right? So now you see that over here, right? It has a since property over there. So this is how we can do this from scratch, but I would also like to show you how you can um, work with this by doing reverse engineering, right? So if I now reverse engineer a particular Neo4j target, right, I can say, okay, here is my Neo4j instance. I have a uh, Aura uh, database that has been pre-set up. I can read the instance of the Neo4j Aura um, uh, database and it will basically immediately show me show me what the uh, uh, the data model looks like right so this is a, a database of the women's world cup uh, I think it was 2019 that we created that at the time so here you see okay this has a number of properties this probably also has some properties you know so we can see how that is being done the cipher as uh, is also generated and you will see that because Neo4j doesn't have many of the schema capabilities um, that you are used to from other data stores, it doesn't have uh, all of the DDL or, or schema specifics that you might be used to. It uses a lot of examples here to, that you'll see in Cypher, but it also allows you to create constraints and stuff like that automatically by working with the uh, plugin that we provide for Neo4j. Right, so lots of other capabilities here. Uh, maybe a couple of more things that I can highlight here at the top you have a um, uh, force directed layout uh, capability right so this is allows you to visualize where uh, where things are going to be positioned you can pin uh, certain parts of the graph to a particular location and then the other elements will follow you can also um, select you know what you want to choose what you want to see inside the uh, visualization right so do you want to see the relationship names yes or no or do you want to see um, the entity boxes uh, you know you can see you can select those things um, from the um, menu here Great. With that, I'm going to wrap up this um, part of our tutorial. I hope this was useful, and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Have a good one.